Delphine Holloway was born and raised in Cordova. From a young age, she was known for her fervent devotion to the church and her unwavering faith. However, those closest to her knew that beneath her pious exterior lay a troubled soul, scarred by a childhood marred with abuse and neglect. Delphine's father, Reverend Beauregard, was a fire and brimstone preacher who ruled his household with an iron fist and a leather belt. Her mother, a meek and submissive woman, turned a blind eye to her husband's cruelty, finding solace in prescription pills and fermented fruit juice. Young Delphine learned early on that the only way to survive was to lose herself in the pages of the Bible, finding comfort in its words and crafting her own interpretations of its teachings. At the age of 18, Delphine met Ezekiel Holloway, a strapping young man who had moved to Cordova from Montgomery to apprentice at the local auto shop. Ezekiel was everything her father was not, kind, gentle, and patient. They married within a year, much to the chagrin of Reverend Beauregard, who viewed Ezekiel as an outsider unworthy of his daughter. Ezekiel Holloway was a simple man with simple dreams. He worked hard, loved his wife, and wanted nothing more than to build a good life for his family. When Delphine gave birth to their son Jeremiah, Ezekiel's world was complete. He doted on the boy, teaching him everything he knew about cars and the value of honest work. Jeremiah Holloway grew up in the shadow of his mother's intensity and his father's expectations. A quiet and introspective child, he often found himself caught between his mother's religious fervor and his father's practical approach to life. As he entered his teenage years, Jeremiah struggled with his own faith, questioning the rigid beliefs that had been instilled in him since birth. The Holloway household was a study in contrasts. Delphine's zealotry often clashed with Ezekiel's more relaxed approach to religion. While Delphine insisted on strict adherence to biblical teachings, often quoting scripture at the dinner table, Ezekiel preferred to show his faith through good deeds and honest living. As Jeremiah grew older, the tension in the house became palpable. Delphine's attention increasingly focused on her son, scrutinizing his every move and decision. She saw in him the purity and devotion she believed her husband lacked. Ezekiel, for his part, grew concerned about the intensity of Delphine's relationship with Jeremiah, but chalked it up to a mother's love and her religious upbringing. Little did anyone know that the seeds of tragedy had already been sown. The complex dynamics of the Holloway family, shaped by generations of trauma, misguided faith and unspoken desires, were about to explode in a way that would leave the entire town of Cordova reeling. The stage was set for a drama of biblical proportions, one that would test the limits of faith, family, and morality. The roots of Delphine's descent into madness and sin can be traced back to her tumultuous childhood. The scars left by her father's abuse and her mother's neglect ran deep, shaping her understanding of love, family, and faith in profound and disturbing ways. As a child, Delphine had learned to dissociate from the pain of her father's beatings by immersing herself in scripture. She would recite verses in her head, finding solace in the words of prophets and apostles. But as she grew older, her interpretations of these sacred texts began to twist and warp, shaped by her trauma and her desperate need for love and acceptance. Delphine's obsession with biblical texts intensified after Jeremiah's birth. She saw her son as a gift from God, a pure vessel untainted by the sins of the world. As Jeremiah grew from a child into a young man, Delphine's focus on him became increasingly intense and unsettling. She began to draw parallels between her relationship with Jeremiah and the stories she read in the Old Testament. The tale of Lot and his daughters particularly fascinated her. In her warped logic, she saw their actions not as a sin, but as a divine duty to preserve their lineage. She convinced herself that in times of great need or higher purpose, even the most taboo acts could be sanctioned by God. Delphine's misinterpretation of Scripture didn't stop there. She fixated on passages that spoke of the special bond between mothers and sons, twisting their meanings to justify her growing obsession. In her mind, her love for Jeremiah was the purest form of devotion, a reflection of God's love for humanity. As Jeremiah entered his late teens, Delphine's feelings towards him began to shift from maternal to something far more sinister. She found herself lingering when he emerged from the shower, her eyes tracing the contours of his body. She imagined running her fingers through his hair, not as a mother comforting a child, but as a lover caressing her beloved. At first, Delphine was horrified by these thoughts. She spent hours on her knees, praying for forgiveness, 
begging God to cleanse her mind of these impure desires. But as time went on, her prayers changed. Instead of asking for these feelings to be taken away, she began to ask for a sign that her love for Jeremiah was part of God's plan. In her desperation, Delphine began to see signs everywhere. A sermon about Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac became, in her mind, proof that a parent's love for their child could transcend conventional morality. A chance encounter with Jeremiah in a dimly lit hallway, where their bodies briefly touched as they passed, was interpreted as divine approval. Delphine's behavior became increasingly erratic. She insisted on homeschooling Jeremiah for his final year of high school, claiming that she needed to protect him from the corrupting influences of the outside world. In reality, she wanted him all to herself, away from the prying eyes of teachers and classmates who might notice the growing tension between them. Ezekiel, absorbed in his work and trusting in his wife's devotion to their son, failed to see the danger signs. He attributed Delphine's intensity to her religious fervor and her desire to ensure Jeremiah grew up to be a good Christian man. As the months passed, Delphine's resolve weakened. Her touches lingered longer, her gazes became more heated, and her words took on double meanings. She convinced herself that she was preparing Jeremiah for a great purpose, that their union would be blessed by God himself. Finally, on a sweltering summer night, as thunder rolled in the distance and lightning illuminated the sky, Delphine made her move. She entered Jeremiah's room, her nightgown clinging to her sweat-soaked skin, and whispered words that would set in motion a chain of events that would destroy them all. My son, my love, God has chosen us. The first encounter between Delphine and Jeremiah was a maelstrom of confusion, desire, and shame. Jeremiah, awakened from a fitful sleep by his mother's presence, found himself trapped between his ingrained respect for her and the disturbing reality of her advances. Delphine, what are you doing? Jeremiah's voice was barely above a whisper, thick with sleep and disbelief. Delphine's response came in a low, fervent tone. God has shown me the way, my sweet boy. We are chosen, just like in the old stories. Her hands, trembling but determined, reached for him in the darkness. What followed was a clash of wills, Jeremiah's initial resistance crumbling under the weight of his mother's insistence and his own confused desires. Years of emotional manipulation and isolation had left him ill-equipped to resist her advances. In the heat of the moment, with thunder crashing outside and his mother's words ringing in his ears, Jeremiah succumbed. The aftermath was a tsunami of conflicting emotions. Jeremiah, overwhelmed with guilt and shame, retreated into himself. He spent hours in the shower, as if the scalding water could wash away the sin that clung to his skin. Delphine, on the other hand, experienced a perverse sense of elation. In her twisted logic, their union was a divine consummation, a fulfillment of God's mysterious plan. In the days that followed, an uneasy tension settled over the Holloway household. Ezekiel, oblivious to the seismic shift in his family's dynamics, noticed only that his wife seemed more serene than usual, while his son had become even more withdrawn. Jeremiah struggled to reconcile his actions with his beliefs. He pored over his Bible, searching for answers, for condemnation, for anything that could make sense of what had happened. But the words that had once brought him comfort now seemed to mock him, every verse a reminder of his sin. Delphine, however, was relentless. She sought out opportunities to be alone with Jeremiah, her touches lingering, her words laden with double meanings. She whispered scripture in his ear, her interpretations becoming more twisted with each passing day. Remember Lot's daughters, my love. They did what was necessary to continue their line. We are no different. Slowly, inevitably, Jeremiah's resistance eroded. The combination of his mother's persistence, his own confused desires, and the isolation from the outside world broke down his defenses. What had begun as a single shocking encounter evolved into a full-blown affair. Their trysts were hurried and furtive, stolen moments in shadowy corners of the house when Ezekiel was at work. Each time, Jeremiah swore it would be the last but each time he found himself drawn back, caught in the web of his mother's devotion and his own conflicted desires. As weeks turned into months, the affair intensified. Delphine's obsession grew, her need for Jeremiah consuming her every waking moment. She began to take risks, her actions becoming bolder and more reckless. She would brush against him at the dinner table, her hand lingering on his thigh beneath the tablecloth, while Ezekiel sat obliviously across from them. She would slip into his room at night, even when her husband was home, 
trusting in Ezekiel's deep sleep to conceal her nocturnal visits. Jeremiah, for his part, oscillated between periods of self-loathing and a twisted acceptance of his new reality. There were moments when he almost believed his mother's ravings, when the line between divine will and madness blurred in his mind. But these moments were always followed by crushing waves of guilt and shame. The strain of their secret began to show. Jeremiah's grades, already suffering from the switch to homeschooling, plummeted. He lost weight, dark circles forming under his eyes from sleepless nights spent wrestling with his conscience. Delphine, in contrast, seemed to glow with a feverish energy, her eyes bright with zealous fire. There were close calls. Once, Ezekiel nearly walked in on them in the laundry room, saved only by the timely slam of the dryer door. Another time, a neighbor spotted Delphine leaving Jeremiah's room in the early hours of the morning, leading to whispered rumors that were quickly quashed by Delphine's reputation as a devoted mother and Christian. As the affair continued, Delphine's grip on reality loosened further. She began to talk about running away together, about starting a new life where they could be together openly. She spoke of bearing Jeremiah's child, of creating a new pure bloodline blessed by God. Jeremiah, horrified by the extent of his mother's delusions, but too entangled to break free, began to contemplate desperate measures. He considered confessing to his father, to their pastor, even to the police. But the fear of destroying his family, of the scandal that would engulf them all, stayed his hand. Little did he know that fate, in its cruel wisdom, was about to force his hand. The day of reckoning was approaching, and the fragile web of lies and forbidden desire that held the Holloway family together was about to be torn apart in the most violent and tragic way imaginable. Ezekiel Holloway was not a man given to flights of fancy or unfounded suspicions. He believed in the goodness of people, in the strength of family, and in the power of honest work. But as the months wore on, even his trusting nature couldn't ignore the subtle shifts in his household's dynamics. It started with small things, hushed conversations that abruptly ceased when he entered a room, meaningful glances exchanged between Delphine and Jeremiah at the dinner table, the growing distance between himself and his son. At first, Ezekiel attributed these changes to the natural growing pains of a family, with a teenager transitioning into adulthood. But as time passed, the oddities became harder to dismiss. Ezekiel noticed Delphine's sudden obsession with her appearance, the way she seemed to glow with a strange, feverish energy. He couldn't help but notice how her eyes followed Jeremiah's every move, a hunger in her gaze that made him uncomfortable in ways he couldn't quite articulate. Jeremiah, on the other hand, seemed to be withering away before Ezekiel's eyes. The boy who had once been full of life and curiosity now moved through the house like a ghost, his eyes haunted, his shoulders hunched as if carrying an invisible burden. When Ezekiel tried to engage him in conversation, Jeremiah's responses were monosyllabic at best, his gaze never quite meeting his father's. There were other troubling signs, too. Ezekiel began to notice items of Delphine's clothing in strange places. Her robe draped over a chair in Jeremiah's room, her slippers outside his door in the early hours of the morning. Once he could have sworn he heard muffled sounds coming from the laundry room, only to find it empty when he investigated. As his suspicions grew, Ezekiel found himself grappling with thoughts too terrible to voice. He tried to rationalize, to find innocent explanations for the tension that had invaded his home. Perhaps Delphine was simply being an overprotective mother. Maybe Jeremiah was struggling with the pressures of his studies. But in the quiet moments, when doubt crept in like a thief in the night, Ezekiel couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly, fundamentally wrong. He tried to confront Delphine about his concerns, but she brushed off his questions with practiced ease. You're imagining things, dear, she would say, her smile never quite reaching her eyes. Jeremiah's just going through a phase. You know how teenagers are. But Ezekiel wasn't convinced. He began to pay closer attention, to watch more carefully. He started coming home from work at odd hours, hoping to catch... What? He wasn't sure. But the need to know, to understand what was happening to his family, consumed him. As the weeks passed... Ezekiel's world began to narrow, focusing solely on unraveling the mystery that had taken root in his home. He knew deep in his bones that something had to give. The tension was building, a storm gathering on the horizon, and Ezekiel was determined to weather it, to protect his family from whatever threat was looming. Little did he know that the truth, when it finally came to light, would shatter his world in ways he could never have imagined.
The stage was set for a confrontation that would end in blood and tears, forever altering the lives of the Holloway family and the entire town of Cordova. On the night of August 15th, a stifling summer evening thick with humidity and unspoken tensions, the carefully constructed facade of the Holloway family finally shattered. The air was heavy, pregnant with the promise of an approaching storm, mirroring the turmoil about to unfold within the walls of their home. Ezekiel had been on edge all day, a nagging feeling in his gut telling him that something was amiss. He'd told Delphine he'd be working late at the shop, a lie that tasted bitter on his tongue. Instead, He'd parked his truck a block away and walked home in the gathering dusk, his heart pounding with each step. As he approached the house, Ezekiel noticed that the lights were off, save for a faint glow emanating from Jeremiah's second-floor bedroom. The silence was oppressive, broken only by the distant rumble of thunder. With trembling hands, he inserted his key into the lock, turning it as quietly as possible. The house was eerily still as Ezekiel crept through the darkened rooms. He paused at the foot of the stairs, straining his ears. That's when he heard it, muffled voices barely audible coming from Jeremiah's room, his son's voice, low and distressed, intermingled with Delphine's fervent whispers. Ezekiel ascended the creaking stairs, his world spinning as he approached Jeremiah's room. The door was slightly ajar, and he could hear muffled voices inside. As he drew closer, he made out Jeremiah's anguished tone, followed by Delphine's unsettlingly seductive response. The words he heard chilled him to the bone. Unable to contain himself any longer, Ezekiel burst into the room. The sight that greeted him was beyond his worst nightmares. His wife and son entangled on the bed, their naked forms bathed in the soft glow of a bedside lamp. For a moment, time stood still as the three of them stared at each other in shock. Then all hell broke loose. Ezekiel let out a primal howl of rage and betrayal. Telfine scrambled off the bed, her eyes wild with fear and fanaticism while Jeremiah remained frozen in shame and terror. Ezekiel's fury was palpable as he confronted them, his voice distorted by disbelief and anger. Delphine, seemingly oblivious to her state of undress, approached Ezekiel with outstretched hands. She pleaded with him to understand, claiming that their actions were part of God's plan. Ezekiel recoiled in disgust, unable to comprehend her words. The situation quickly escalated into violence. Ezekiel lunged at Delphine, his hands closing around her throat. Jeremiah snapped out of his stupor and leapt to his mother's defense. The three of them grappled in a chaotic tangle of limbs and raw emotions as lightning flashed outside. In the struggle, Ezekiel accidentally struck Jeremiah, sending him crashing into the bedside table. The lamp toppled over, plunging the room into darkness save for the intermittent flashes of lightning. Delphine's scream pierced through the rumble of thunder. What followed was a blur of desperate violence. In the darkness, Ezekiel felt something hard and metallic pressed into his hand, Jeremiah's forgotten baseball bat. Without thinking, he swung, connecting with something solid. A sickening crunch filled the air, followed by a thud. The next flash of lightning revealed a horrifying scene. Delphine lay crumpled on the floor, blood pooling around her head. Jeremiah's anguished voice cut through the ensuing silence as he confronted his father about what he had done. The reality of the situation came crashing down on Ezekiel. He staggered back, the bat slipping from his nerveless fingers. Delphine lay motionless, her eyes staring sightlessly at the ceiling. In that moment, Ezekiel realized that his life and the lives of his family would never be the same. As if on cue, the heavens opened, rain lashing against the windows. The storm that had been threatening all evening finally broke, its fury matching the tempest of emotions raging within the Holloway home. In the span of a few brutal minutes, a family had been torn apart. A life had been taken and a terrible secret had been exposed. As Jeremiah sobbed over his mother's body, and Ezekiel stood frozen in shock, the sound of sirens could be heard in the distance, growing louder with each passing second. The night of August 15th would go down in Cordova's history as the beginning of a scandal that would shake the small town to its very foundations. The aftermath of Delphine Holloway's death sent shockwaves through the quiet town of Cordova. The arrival of police cruisers, their lights painting the neighborhood in alternating flashes of red and blue, drew curious neighbors from their homes despite the pouring rain. Whispers and speculations spread like wildfire as Ezekiel was led away in handcuffs, his face a mask of shock and despair. Detective Lorraine Blackwell, a seasoned investigator from the county sheriff's office, took charge of the case. From the moment she stepped into the Holloway home, she knew this was no ordinary domestic dispute gone wrong. 
The scene in Jeremiah's bedroom, the tangled sheets, the discarded clothing, the baseball bat smeared with blood, told a story far more sinister than anyone could have imagined. As dawn broke over Cordova, casting a pale light over the crime scene, the full horror of the situation began to unfold. Jeremiah, still in shock, was taken to the hospital for evaluation. His initial statement, given between bouts of hysterical crying, painted a picture so disturbing that even the hardened detectives found themselves shaken. The investigation moved quickly. Forensic teams combed through the Holloway home, uncovering evidence that suggested the incestuous relationship between Delphine and Jeremiah had been going on for months. Delphine's journals, hidden in a locked drawer in her bedside table, provided a chilling glimpse into her descent into madness and religious fervor. As news of the scandal broke, the tight-knit community of Cordova found itself torn apart. Those who had known the Holloways for years struggled to reconcile the image of the perfect Christian family with the horrific reality. The First Baptist Church, where Delphine had taught Sunday school, became a hotbed of gossip and speculation. Pastor Thaddeus Winters, his face ashen and his voice trembling, addressed his congregation the following Sunday. My friends, he began, we are faced with a tragedy that tests the very limits of our faith and compassion. His sermon, a plea for understanding and forgiveness, fell on deaf ears for many. The shock was too fresh, the betrayal too deep. As the investigation progressed, more details came to light. Interviews with family, friends, and acquaintances revealed that there had been signs of trouble in the Holloway household for months. Neighbors recalled hearing arguments, seeing Jeremiah looking increasingly withdrawn. A teacher from his former school remembered instances where Delphine's behavior had seemed overly possessive, even for a devoted mother. Ezekiel held in county jail awaiting trial, retreated into a shell of silence. His initial shock gave way to a deep, all-consuming guilt. He refused to see visitors, speaking only to his court-appointed lawyer in monosyllabic responses. Jeremiah, released from the hospital after a week, became a virtual prisoner in his aunt's home two towns over. Traumatized and confused, he alternated between defending his mother's actions and expressing relief that the nightmare was over. Mental health professionals worked tirelessly to help him process the years of manipulation and abuse he had endured. As weeks turned into months, the investigation began to wind down. Detective Blackwell, her face lined with exhaustion, prepared to hand the case over to the district attorney. The evidence was overwhelming, the tragedy undeniable. But as she looked over her notes one final time, she couldn't shake the feeling that there were no winners in this case, only victims, their lives forever altered by a toxic brew of misguided faith, unresolved trauma, and forbidden desires. The stage was set for a trial that would captivate the nation, forcing people to confront uncomfortable truths about the nature of faith, family, and the darkness that can lurk behind even the most respectable facades. The trial of Ezekiel Holloway began on a crisp autumn morning, six months after the fateful night that had torn his family apart. District Attorney Vaughn Prescott, a man known for his sharp mind and sharper tongue, laid out the prosecution's case with meticulous detail. He painted a picture of a man driven to violence by betrayal and shame, emphasizing the brutality of Delphine's death. Crime scene photos flashed on a screen, eliciting gasps from the jury and spectators alike. Ezekiel's defense attorney, the young and ambitious Amelia Roth, faced an uphill battle. Her strategy hinged on portraying Ezekiel as a victim himself, a man who had snapped under unimaginable circumstances. She brought in expert witnesses to testify about the psychological impact of discovering a spouse's infidelity, especially in cases involving incest. The trial's most dramatic moment came when Jeremiah took the stand. Now nineteen and visibly gaunt, he spoke in a monotone, his eyes never leaving the floor as he recounted years of manipulation and abuse at his mother's hands. His testimony was a double-edged sword. While it garnered sympathy for Ezekiel, it also underscored the violent nature of his response. As the trial progressed, the town of Cordova found itself divided. Some residents, horrified by Delphine's actions, saw Ezekiel as a tragic figure who had been pushed beyond his limits. Others condemned him as a murderer, arguing that nothing could justify taking a life. The jury deliberated for three days, an eternity for those waiting with bated breath for the verdict. When they finally filed back into the courtroom, the atmosphere was electric. The foreman, a middle-aged woman with kind eyes, stood to deliver the verdict. On the charge of first-degree murder, we find the defendant, 
Ezekiel Holloway not guilty, she announced, pausing as murmurs rippled through the courtroom. On the charge of voluntary manslaughter, we find the defendant guilty. The sentencing hearing, held two weeks later, was a somber affair. Judge Blackstone, her face grave, addressed Ezekiel directly before pronouncing her decision. Mr. Holloway, she began, the tragedy that has befallen your family is beyond measure. While the court acknowledges the extraordinary circumstances that led to your actions, we cannot condone the taking of a life. She sentenced him to twelve years in state prison, with the possibility of parole after eight years. As Ezekiel was led away, his eyes met Jeremiah's for a brief moment. In that glance, a lifetime of love, pain, and regret passed between father and son. Then the doors closed and Ezekiel disappeared from view.